All right. Thanks, Tyler. Yep, so as you mentioned, my name is Josh Bauer. I am with Somatic, and today I'm going to be talking about on-demand ray clusters and ML workflows via Kuberay and Somatic. And if you don't know what all those words mean, hopefully you will by the end of the talk. So, let's see, got to get my clicker right here. All right, the big idea here is that there are essentially two ways that you can run an array cluster. And I'm going to start off with the way that most people are probably familiar with, which is a long-lived cluster. So the way this works is at some point your company decides to adopt Ray, so they spin up a Ray cluster, and then that Ray cluster just sits there. It keeps running, it keeps running. Maybe you take it down for maintenance every once in a while, but other than that, it's there. Anytime somebody comes along with a workload that they want to execute on Ray, they just submit it to that cluster, the cluster does its thing, you're done. So what are the pros and cons to this approach? One is that the workload startup latency is very small. This is one thing that Ray is super, super good at. Also, relatedly, there isn't much need for packaging your workload code. The cluster just has to have all the dependencies on it. And if that's the case, then whenever you send your workload, you just have to send the little bit of pickled code that represents the workload, as well as the inputs, and you're often at the races. Additionally, the Ray dashboard was designed for this kind of setup, so you're going to get the most use out of it by using this mechanism. There are also some cons, of course, as with all things. So one con is that new workload dependencies are tricky. If somebody decides that they would like to use some new library, let's call it Foo, and the cluster does not have Foo installed on it, then they're kind of a little bit out of luck. Not totally out of luck, thankfully, because Ray does have a thing they call runtime environments, where you can basically, at workload execution time, install on the cluster uh, the dependency. However, there are a number of issues that make this not ideal for a production use case, and uh, can reduce your reliability as well as hit your startup latency. There is also a con that some workload might produce different results at different times, depending on the state of the cluster. As an example of how this might happen, Let's say you run something on Monday morning, it works great, you're happy, you go to sleep, the people managing your cluster decide to upgrade it overnight, you wake up Tuesday morning, you submit your same workload again, and oh no, something is broken. Because some library that was on the cluster had some backwards incompatible change, and oh, something freaky is happening with the screen. Okay, uh, somebody made some backwards incompatible change, and now all of a sudden your code is broken. Uh, another downside to this approach is that it can be a little bit hard to get a granular view on the resource usage. So you can get very high level views about how your cluster as a whole is behaving. And you can sometimes get very granular views in terms of uh, what some individual task or actor might be doing. But it's a little bit harder to get an intermediate view where you're looking at what are the properties of a given workload, let's say a training job. There is an alternative to this. Uh, this is basically the other extreme from a long-lived cluster. This would be an on-demand cluster. So the idea here is each and every workload gets its own special Ray cluster. So there are a number of benefits to this approach, and I'm going to go over them in more detail in a few slides. But for now, you can just look at the pretty list of pros. Uh, there are also, as with all things, some cons to this approach. Uh, it's a little bit more complex. You have to manage the state of these ephemeral clusters, so you've got to have some tooling around that. Uh, there is also a hit to your startup latency because you have to actually start these clusters uh, on demand. And then you also uh, lose some of the benefits of the Ray cluster, because, or the Ray dashboard, rather, because when your workload finishes, the Ray dashboard for that ephemeral cluster is going to go away. So before we get too deep into the talk, I'm going to give a disclaimer here. I'm not going to tell you that you all need to go home and rewrite your Ray clusters so that they're all ephemeral, uh, because this is engineering, and there are always trade-offs. Uh, so there are those pros and cons with each of the approaches. You have to evaluate your particular use case, your particular need, and find out whether this is a worthwhile approach for you. Uh, I happen to work at a company called Somatic, where we are uh, focused on ML workflows and orchestration pipelines. And for the users of our product, uh, a lot of the benefits of this ephemeral or on-demand uh, cluster approach uh, outweigh the cons. And so it's one that I'm uh, very interested in and hope that you will be as well. So with that, let's talk about some of those benefits in more detail. 
One of the benefits that I claimed was that you can improve your reproducibility with this approach. And the idea here is uh, you can put in long-term storage lots of information about your workload, including not only the image that defines the code for the workload itself, as well as the configuration for that workload, but also the configuration for the ephemeral cluster that you want to spin up for that workload. And then when you're ready to execute it again, you can pull all that stuff out of long-term storage and uh, spin it up, run it, and have a high degree of confidence that whatever happens is going to be the same as what happens when you put everything away in storage in the first place. Modulo any indeterminacies that happen to be present in your code itself. So a couple of other claims that I made about the benefits that you can get are that you can improve your observability and efficiency. In order to get an idea of where this comes from, you can take a look at the code snippet in the upper left. Many of us have probably been here before where you're going to submit something to Ray, and it's asking you for how much memory it's going to take, and you have to kind of shrug your shoulders and say, I don't really know. I'm just going to make some guess about how much memory it's going to take. Probably you're going to guess really high at first, just to make sure the thing doesn't fail. And then maybe you'll do a little bit of manual binary searching down to lower the memory to get it down to a place where uh, you're confident that it's not going to fail, but you don't really know whether you have a lot more than you really need. Contrast that with if you're using these on-demand clusters. In this case, uh, every cluster is associated with exactly one workload. So when you look at the memory profile of that cluster, you know that it's all coming from your workload. And in this case, you know exactly how much memory your workload is going to take. And then you can uh, come up with a much better and much more appropriate size for uh, the request of the memory. And when you're doing this at scale across lots of different workloads, you can really improve the efficiency of uh, the resources that you request to make sure that you're uh, only asking for what you need. So let's talk a little bit more about those cons. With many of these things, we're going to mitigate the cons with tooling. One of the first cons that I talked about was there's some added complexity around managing the cluster state, making sure that the clusters get started at the right time, make sure they get stopped at the right time. And there are some tools that you can use for this. Uh, one of those is Kubray. Uh, several of you may be familiar with it already. If not, there are some talks about it uh, today. I think there was one just before this, and there's another one this evening. But it, it'll, as its name suggests, is built on top of Kubernetes. And essentially, it allows you to define a YAML file, as with many things in Kubernetes, that defines the state of what you would like to exist in the world declaratively. In this case, you define, what would I like my Ray cluster to look like? You post that YAML to the Kubernetes cluster, and then behind the scenes, Kubray will make sure that it creates that cluster. And then when you're done, you just delete that YAML from Kubernetes, and it will tear things down. They also actually have an alpha feature that is specifically for this on-demand use case. They call uh, Ray job primitive in alpha. Um, but this tool is very powerful. It's also very configurable. You can define exactly what you want your containers to look like, uh, which properties you want the uh, uh, container to have with regards to what infrastructure it runs on. However, that all does come at a cost of having to know some things about Kubernetes and how to configure everything. Another tool that you can use is Somatic. Uh, again, the product that uh, I work on. It's particularly useful in the case of orchestrating a larger workflow, but can also be used for individual workloads. And to see how we integrate with Ray, you can take a look at the snippet in the upper right. You can see on line six there, there's that line with Ray cluster. And what this is telling Somatic is, hey, Here's a configuration for a Ray cluster that defines how many nodes it has, how many CPUs each node should have, so on and so forth. Can you spin one of those up for me? It's going to do that, spin up the cluster for you, connect your code to it, and then once it enters that with block, you can do whatever you like with your cluster, in this case, training a classifier. And then when your code is done, uh, it, whether it exits successfully or unsuccessfully, Somatic will make sure that it tears down that cluster. So another con that I mentioned was that you take a hit to startup latency in this case. And the first point I'd like to make about this con is, in a lot of cases, that doesn't really matter. If you're going to be doing a training job that's going to take several hours, several days, or even more, it doesn't really matter all that much if it takes several minutes for your workload to actually begin executing. 
However, there is one case where it actually matters a lot that it takes a few minutes before your code starts running, and that is when you are iterating during development. So, you know, when you're in the zone, you make some change to your code, you want to run it and see what happens right away. You don't want to wait, you know, 15 minutes before your first line of code executes on the cloud. So what can you do about this? One important thing is to try running your code locally before you run it in the cloud. With a lot of products and tooling, this can be easier said than done. With Somatic, we try to make it easy. You can just change a command line flag, and that'll switch whether the Ray cluster that it creates is local on your machine or whether it's in the cloud. Uh, you can also use auto-scaling to start more quickly with a small cluster. The idea here being that if you request only a small amount of resources to start, you can get those resources allocated, and your first line of code will begin executing much more quickly than if you had to wait for all the resources to become available at once before you could even begin. You also can make sure that you are leveraging caching appropriately when it comes to your Docker images, so that any small change to your code is just a small diff that needs to be built, pushed to the cloud, downloaded on the workers. And then there's another approach you can take, which is targeted strictly towards development, which is where you can essentially spin up a cluster just for yourself, not for your workload, use that during some development session, and then when you're done with it, you spin that down. If you're interested in this approach, there are some details about it online in a post that Shopify put out about their Merlin uh, platform, and so you can feel free to Google that later if you're interested. And then the final con that I mentioned was that you lose some of the utility of the dashboard that comes bundled with Ray if you go with these on-demand clusters. However, there are a lot of tools that you can use in order to mitigate that as well. Uh, one is to combine Prometheus and Grafana. It's a combo that many people are likely familiar with. And when you do this, uh, again, you can often get more power than the Ray dashboard alone can give you because you can get these workload level views of the resource usage. And then Somatic can also help here. If you're using it in that way that was shown uh, a few slides back, uh, then you're going to get information about the life cycle of your on-demand cluster, as shown in the screenshot on the right. We'll also give you access to all the logs associated with your workload, metric information, uh, strong visualizations of your inputs and outputs, lots of other things, source control, how this fits into a broader uh, workflow. Essentially, visibility is super important to us at Somatic, and we make sure that we give you as much tooling as we can around that. And that's about it. We maybe have time for one or two questions. And then after that, if you want to see me, I'll be over at the Somatic booth. So any questions? Anybody? All right, great. Well, Let's give Josh a round of applause. Thank you so much, Josh.